This this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday. Over the airways of ESPN Radio, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio, Sirius XM style, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888 Say ESPN. Lots of stuff to get into today. Of course, the NCAA, they've got a commission. They've got a recommendation from the commission. We definitely will be talking about that. Apparently, the commission has proposed getting rid of the NBA's one-and-done rule. The NCAA's one-and-done rule, rather. The NBA, you know, with their 19 and all, you know, 19 years or, you know, one year removed from that. They made some suggestions with that. Basically talking about the NCAA working in concert with the NBA. There's some things they did do that I like. There are other things they didn't suggest that I did not like. These are the kind of things that we get into, we will get into as the show progresses today right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. That's one thing that we definitely will get into. The other is Meek Mill. Meek Mill, rap artist out of Philadelphia, freshly released from Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. You know, no doubt. Robert Kraft, owner of the New England Patriots, along with Michael Rubin, the uh, minority owner for the Philadelphia 76ers, had something to do with that. Rubin picked him up himself, heliported him into the stadium. Wells Fargo Center last night in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where I was in attendance. And, yes, I did see and speak to Meek Mill, and I'll share that with you a little bit later on in the show. But the bottom line is clear. He is out of prison. He is free. And how do I feel about all of the roaring and the hoopla that was, and the celebration that was associated with it. I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. But first things first, because the first thing that we got to get into are the games themselves. And where it comes down to is this. The Warriors finished off the San Antonio Spurs in five games last night. They take on the New Orleans Pelicans next. The Philadelphia 76ers, they took the Miami Heat out in five. As a result, they face the winner of Boston-Milwaukee next. In all likelihood, it'll be Boston. The Cleveland Cavaliers play a game tonight. Could this be LeBron James' last game in Cleveland? I'm here to tell you the answer is no. Cleveland's not losing tonight. Cleveland's going to win this series in six games as far as I'm concerned. Indiana, I like them a lot. Oladipo is a star, but there are levels to this. And LeBron is on another level. And even though he appears to be a one-man wrecking crew against this particular team, I think it's going to be enough. So the real question to me is not about LeBron James in terms of whether or not this is his last game in Cleveland because of a loss, a potential loss, and then a potential loss in game six. To me, the issue is us asking that question at all. Have we reached a conclusion where there is no way in hell that LeBron James is staying in Cleveland? Have we reached a conclusion that not only do we believe he's gone and he's not going to stay in Cleveland, have we asked ourselves, would he be completely justified? And after we answer those questions, then we must ask ourselves this, ourselves this, where would be the best place for for LeBron James to go? Should he come to New York and and join Kristaps Porzingis? Should he go to L.A. and join Kuzma and Randall and Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram? Should he go to Houston where he could join CP3 and James Harden? Or should he come to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to join Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid and about five dudes over six feet six who can all shoot, and I haven't even brought J.J. Redick into the equation, who's their best shooter, most experienced player, and signed a one-year $23 million deal last summer to be here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must say to you, not that I feel this way, but on this particular moment, just to bring some, some levity to the situation, in this particular moment, if I wanted to have something against J.J. Reddick, it would be justified. Now, Stephen A., oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness, Stephen A., what what are you talking about? This is the first I'm hearing of this. How did this happen? What are you doing turning against J.J. Reddick? I'll tell you how. I'm not going to tell you where, but all I'll tell you is this. Yesterday, 
at an undisclosed location. I was cornered. Ben Simmons, Robert Covington, J.J. Redick, and that turncoat, one of my best buddies in the world, who works for the Philadelphia 76ers. His name is Al Lumpkin. That Benedict Arnold. That, 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 that turncoat. He betrayed me. They all cornered me. How dare you pick Donovan Mitchell over Ben Simmons for your rookie of the year vote? They cornered me. I won't say they were quite intimidating. JJ Reddick, he did everything but call me an idiot. He did everything but call me an idiot. And I gotta say this to you, as offended as I am. I was kind of scared. I was kind of scared. Because damn it, they were making some good arguments. <laughs> I gotta confess it. I gotta confess it. They, they had me, they had me cornered. I mean, it was a tough, it was a tough, tough, it was a tough, tough meeting. I gotta confess. I gotta confess. I felt like, I felt like I was in front of the Justice Department. I mean, it was bad. They cornered me. Okay? And they made some very good arguments, if I should say so myself. I couldn't even deny it. But I prevailed, ladies and gentlemen. I stood my ground. And J.J. Reddick looked at me with such disgust. I, I almost forgot I was cool with the brother. I almost forgot I was cool with him. I really, really did. But it was a fun moment. And they do make some very compelling arguments on behalf of um of uh, Ben Simmons for Rookie of the Year honors. There's no question about it. But transcending beyond that, the Philadelphia 76ers are for real to me, y'all. They just are. They're just loaded. They have depth. They have size. They have athleticism. They have leadership. Um, they've got a point guard in Ben Simmons, who is a superstar in the making. They just got it all, man. They, they This is a special, special crew. And I think that they're going to go to the finals. Now, do I think they would beat the Golden State Warriors with Steph Curry? Absolutely not. But I do believe if Steph Curry comes back and they're healthy, the Golden State Warriors against the Philadelphia 76ers would be a tremendous NBA final series. I really, really believe that. I think it would be something special to behold. It would. Houston against Philly would be great, too. Now, some people might look at me and say, Stephen A., you're so disrespectful. Why are you just dismissing Boston? I'm not really trying to dismiss anybody. I think Boston, with their talent and with Jalen Brown, who I love, I love this brother, I just believe that with Kyrie and Gordon Hayward both out, you just don't have enough of this Sixers team. Because Ben Simmons with Joel Embiid, the combination of what they do on a basketball court opens things for shooters. And Bellinelli can shoot. Ilasova can shoot. Covington can shoot. Redick is a sniper. Anderson can shoot. And when you look at this team and what they bring to the table and the fact that they hit perimeter shots and they defend, I can't say enough. I just can't say enough about what I see from these Philadelphia 76ers. It simply cannot be ignored. The time has come. The time has arrived for us to concede that. Now, you got other people holding on to Toronto. They're looking at Boston. Those are the two biggest threats. They're not showing the Washington Wizards enough respect. And maybe Washington deserves that at this particular moment in time, even though they've won two straight and they've notched that series with Toronto at 2-2. I look at Indiana. I'm not sold, y'all. I think LeBron wins this series of six games, like I said before the series began. But I'm just of the mindset right now, the big question right now, is where should LeBron go next? See, to me, if you're just thinking about basketball, of course you say Philly. Because LeBron with Ben Simmons would almost be unfair. The flip side to it, however, is what if you're looking beyond basketball and you're asking yourself, LeBron, if you leave Cleveland, really? That's where you'd go? Right up the road to Philadelphia? I mean, damn. I mean, come on. I don't know. I just don't know. I'm just of the mindset that if I'm LeBron, if I'm going to leave, I'm going to go out west. Go Hollywood. 
Bring another star with you. If I'm LeBron, I'm trying to get Magic to get Kawhi. LeBron and Kawhi together? Lord, that could be special. With the young guns with a Kuzma and the young guns that they've got? I like that. These are all things that are worthy of consideration. These are all things that would be incredibly interesting and are the kind of things that you can't ignore. That's just the way that I feel about it. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That's one of the many things that we plan on getting into today right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Look, last night was a surreal experience in its own right, okay? Um, We got to look at things for what they are. I met Meek Mill for the first time last night. Um, I saw him heliported into the stadium. I saw the Sixers bring him to midcourt to ring the bell. He was sitting right next to Kevin Hart. It's good to see him. You know, he's a Philadelphian, former undisputed middleweight champion of the world. Bernard Hopkins was in attendance. Bernard Hopkins screamed in my ear about the, how there's a whole bunch of Meek Mills in prison. There's a whole bunch of folks. And what was he alluding to? I think it's time for us to be careful and to really dissect this for what it is and really dig deep into exactly what transpired and why it's so important for all of us to sit up there and just look at things for the way they are and the way they should be. On one hand, we have to think about something here. The issue of mass incarceration and a parole slash probationary system in this country is something to take a good, long, hard look at. It can't be ignored. It simply can't. You have a situation right now where in Philadelphia, you're talking about a probationary, uh, a probation rate. That's the highest arguably in the country. You're talking about folks being labeled as parole violators because they left the state when what they did was leave Philadelphia and go to Cherry Hill, New Jersey for dinner. And because they cross state lines, you're in violation of your probation and you get to sit in jail at the discretion of the judge until the judge elects to let you out. And sometimes that's three, four, five months at a time. And all we hear is that you violated your parole, but people are trying to give the impression that you've committed a crime. These are the kind of things that we've got to pay attention to. Meek Mill ultimately was accused of violation, violating his probation and I forgot what it was about, but Pop and Wheelies had something to do with it. And so the judge wants to bring the hammer down. Even the prosecutor did not recommend jail time. If the prosecutor didn't recommend jail time and you've got a defense attorney that's saying this is personal and a judge who handed down a sentence to him from a decade earlier and somehow, some way, this same judge keeps presiding over him. And she's talking about sending a message. Does that sound, does that not sound personal to you? So in that regard, you hear those kind of things and you're saying, this is a bit excessive. This is a bit too much. There's something wrong with this picture and there's something that needs to be be done about this. The judge, Brinkley, sentenced Miller two to four years in prison for violating probation. She cited a failed drug test, failure to comply with an order restricting his travel, and two other unrelated arrests. One in St. Louis for a fight in an airport where charges against him were later dropped, and the other for reckless driving in New York City when he was popping wheelies. Two to four years in prison for that? We have to start thinking about things like that. To me, we also need to start thinking about who's profiting over the off of off the prison systems. Last time I, ch- I checked, you've got some private contractors owning prisons. You flood those prisons 
It's good for business. So is it really about laws? Is it really about morals? Or is it really about feeding a system monetarily into perpetuity? What is it about? Now, I say all of that by saying this. I don't know Meek Mill from a can of paint. I've listened to a couple of his records. I know he's pretty damn talented. I know he used to date Nicki Minaj. No crime in that. I also know I met him for the first time last night. He was incredibly nice to me. I wish him nothing but the best. I'm a fan of second chances. I think that people who make mistakes should be given an opportunity to rectify themselves and to be steered in the right direction. I, however, don't ignore the multitude of arrests and violations that existed from years ago. How those things should have never happened. And how in a system of laws, laws have to be enforced because that ultimately has to serve as a deterrent for, for actions to not be repeated. So what I'm saying and why I bring that up is that let's make sure that if we're celebrating the release of Meek Mill and I have nothing against this brother, I don't know the particulars. I'm not judging him. He's out of jail. I wish him nothing but the best. I even invited him on first take. Because he said he's a fan of the show and he watches it all the time. Every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I guess they allowed him to watch it in prison. I got nothing but love for the brother. Wish him nothing but the best. But I want to make sure that everybody understands. That if you see folks protesting and you see folks ultimately celebrating his release. Understand why. O.J. Simpson, for example, had absolutely positively nothing to do with a Meek Mill case. That was a double murder. If it were up to me, O.J. would be under the jail with the sodomites for the rest of his natural life. Obviously, Meek Mill doesn't deserve something like that. And I'm not comparing the two, but I'm speaking specifically as it pertains to the celebrations. Folks in the streets that were celebrating OJ's release as abhorrent and repulsive as that appeared, even to me. Because this behind should have been in jail. I also knew why. So often, so many times, minorities, in particular African Americans, have been so victimized by the quote unquote system that it was nice to see the system get screwed over for a change as it pertained to OJ. That's just a fact. I'm just giving it to you real. In the case of Meek Mill, this is not the system being screwed over. This is the system working in a manner that it's supposed to, where the actions of a particular judge in a position of power, obviously, had been usurped by a higher authority of judges who said, there's something wrong with this. And we're going to need this man to be released. And while we're at that, ladies and gentlemen, as sickening as it may be for some of us, particularly from the minority communities, to always see someone from the white community getting credit. Facts are facts. Don't think for one second that Robert Kraft And Michael Rubin had nothing to do with his release. When a billionaire owner for the NFL shows up to support you. And an owner for an NBA franchise shows up to support you. And they have, they represent a league that's predominantly black. That rakes in billions. For a local economy. That kind of matters whether you like it or not. So there's credit to be spread and circulated all around here. And there is cause to celebrate Meek Mill's release. 
But whether it pertains to Meek Mill specifically depends on how he conducts himself moving forward to make sure that the efforts on his behalf were not in vain. But the real reason for the celebration is that our system of justice has provided us, has provided us all with hope that the issue of mass incarcerations, that the probations and the parole system that exists in our country has to be addressed quick, fast, and in a hurry. And this was a profound step in doing just that. That is the reason that we should be celebrating Meek Mill's release. And if indeed that is the reason we're celebrating, then cheer on, cheer on. If Meek Mill specifically is the reason and the only reason we're celebrating it, then whether or not our celebration was in vain is entirely up to him. Straight Talk Wireless, nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Back with your calls and more in a minute. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance. So he switched and saved. So it was all good. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. One of the other things that I'm going to get into a little bit later on in this show um, is an article that appeared today in the New York Times. It says in the article, inside the confidential NFL meeting to discuss national anthem protest. And essentially, ladies and gentlemen, the article is referring to a meeting last October. About 30 folks in all, players and coaches, met And they convened urgently at the league's headquarters on Park Avenue. It was nearly a month after President Donald Trump began deriding the league and its players over protests during the national anthem. Somebody secretly audio taped this meeting. And they've leaked it to the New York Times. Whoa. I got a lot to say about that. I got a whole lot to say about that. Stay tuned. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Lenny in Carolina. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Lenny. What's up, my brother? What's up, brother? How you doing? Okay. Talk to me. All right. I got three things real quick. Yes, sir. Um, The one thing that I learned about this series with Philadelphia and Miami is when three is not falling, Ben Simmons needs to take over. He can get to the rack at any time he wants to. He's got to take it to the rack to get everybody else back involved. Okay. If the three is not falling, he's got to he's got to take it to the rack. He didn't do that enough for me. That's just my opinion. That's number one. Number two, what happened to Jaleel Okafor and Norris Noel? The, the Sixers drafted those guys too. Where are they at? Well, Jaleel Okafor got traded to the Brooklyn Nets. Um, non-factor. New Orleans Noel was in Dallas. Um, he had passed up like 17 million a year before last season and now has fallen off the map for some inexplicable reason. They're both struggling. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, number three, last thing. And I disagree with you a little bit on the Meek Mill thing. Okay. I loved the fact that they did what they did for him and he had him out there at the bell and he so got out I. of prison. I, I agree with all that. So do I. But Stephen A., if you, if you violate your probation, Mm-hmm. You got to have some punishment. Now, no, no, was no. she overzealous? Whoa, 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 whoa. That's she was a little overzealous. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Nobody's saying he should, he shouldn't have had no punishment. The issue was with uh, did the punishment fit the crime. Nobody's trying to imply that you just get to 
violate your probation or anything like that. But if you pop in wheelies and that's considered a violation of your probation, I got a problem with that. If you live in Center City, Philadelphia, all right, and you went to eat at Lamberti's restaurant in South Jersey, and that's a violation, I mean, damn, you know, again, it's a violation. It's not something that should have happened. But to, but to, but for the punishment to be two to four years in prison, we got a problem. That's the point. And, and I definitely agree with that. She was overzealous with the punishment, but if he's got to get some kind of punishment because sure. when you sign that thing for probation, they tell you, you cannot do this. And you did it anyway. 15 to 30 days in jail, not even prison. But jail. Okay. I could have lived with that. Well, I, so but could I. Two so to I. four years. So, could, so do I. Yeah, we agree. There's no disagreement between us, Lenny. None whatsoever. All right, brother. All I right. love you, man. And I'm, I'm still listening. I appreciate you, bro. Thank you so much. Let's go to Phil in Ohio. You're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, man. What's up, buddy? Let me get straight to the point, man. Right. I'm clearly a LeBron James fan. Okay, but I got a question for you. I want to hear what you got to say about this. I'm going to sure. give you a scenario. You got LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers in the 76ers in the uh, Eastern Conference Finals, right? Just uh, say the. Yes, sir. The 76ers. Philadelphia, the against, 76ers. Philadelphia against Cleveland. Yes, sir, I do. Yes, sir. Okay, so say if Philly defeat LeBron James and Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, I'm not even saying they'll win the NBA title, but just say that happened. Would LeBron James get criticized? just like Kevin Durant did, going to a team that defeated him the year before. I want to hear what you got to say about that, man. I thank you, man, and I'm about to listen. Oh, man, that's a good question. That's a good question. I don't think it would be the same because I think LeBron is already a champion. The fact that he's already won three chips and he's been to seven straight NBA finals is entirely different than somebody who never captured a championship and jumped on a 73-9 and bandwagon to capture one, meaning from the previous season. Um, there's a difference there, but I do understand that. And I think that was a valid question on your part. Appreciate the call. Chris in LA, you're live with Stephen. They talk to me. Hey, Stephen. Hey, happy, happy Wednesday. I want to applaud you on what you said regarding, uh, Meek Mills, um, to enlighten all your listeners on that, man. Just want to applaud you for that. All right. But man. I actually want to address what you said regarding, uh, LeBron and the Warriors potential matchup with the Sixers in the finals. Well, the first thing with LeBron um, a quick question for you. Do you believe, and this was something I've been thinking about, do you believe that the what Joel Embiid said after game four against Miami when he um, mentioned that he likes the team he has, I'm paraphrasing, and basically he thinks they can go far. You think that's a subliminal message towards LeBron and potentially joining them in no. the agency? No, okay. I, don't, I don't think it's subliminal. I, don't, I think he's addressing it now. He's saying now's our moment. We don't know what we're going to have in the future. We don't know what Boston and other, and, and other teams are going to be like in the future. Our time is now. We don't need to be thinking about the future when we're right here, right now, with an opportunity to do our damage here. That's what he's saying. Right. Got you. Okay. I wasn't sure on that. Um, and my, I want to address what you said regarding the Sixers and the Warriors being a potential epic matchup. I disagree with you, Stephen. I think that they would be suited better to go up against Houston if they were to come out. So I think that the Warriors would be able to spread them out too much. You got to keep in mind that the Warriors move the ball so well. Houston, they're a good assist team as well, but they play more one-on-one basketball, so that would suit Joel Embiid more to not have to get up and down the floor so much. Golden State's going to spread you out, and they're going to constantly run. Well, I didn't, and, say, I didn't say that Golden, uh, Houston and Philadelphia wouldn't be an epic matchup. I'm just saying that I picked Golden State to come to the finals. So if I picked Golden State, that's who I'm focused on because I believe they're the ones that will be standing in the end if Steph Curry is healthy. If Houston is, then that would be great too. But I believe it's going to be the Warriors. I didn't say that the Warriors would just be better than Houston as a matchup. I think either matchup would make for an incredibly compelling NBA Finals. But I love the thought of Draymond Green talking his smack and Joel B and B talking his. I, I kind of love it. I, I agree. So real quick before you let me go. So who do you think is a better match for Philly? Is it Golden State or is it Houston? Well, I, I, think, for, I think for Philly, it's a, Houston's a better matchup because I don't think Houston has the requisite weapons that Golden State have. They may have a, an, a, a bevy of shooters as well, but Golden State has Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. And the two of those dudes aren't just scorers. They're playmakers. Okay? Whereas I'm looking at Houston, even though you have Chris Paul and James Harden, have you seen what Chris Paul's life is like when he goes against Steph Curry? It's kind of rough. It's kind of rough. And I love me some Chris Paul. He's a Hall of Famer. But but I'm just telling you, it's it's kind of rough. Because what is Chris Paul supposed to do when a cat pulls up from 40? 
See, Chris Paul can guard anybody, even if he's short. He can still guard, any, even if he's shorter, rather, he can still guard anybody if they're trying to dance on him and get into the lane and make things happen. But when you just pull up, when you just pull up from 40, what is he supposed to do with that? There's nothing he can nothing. do. All right? Right. No, I agree. I, agree I got to bounce. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. More on the NBA playoffs. More on Meek Mill in a minute. And I'll get into some stuff about this NFL story uh, with somebody leaking confidential, uh, confidential excerpts from a meeting to the New York Times. Actually, not even leaking excerpts. They audio recorded it secretly and leaked that to the New York Times. Wait till you hear what some of the some of the things that was said. Wait until you hear about it. By the way, spring has arrived. That means so has Major League Baseball season. The crack of the bat, the smell of the grass. It's time to head to the stadium and experience all the action. So what's the best way to get tickets to the ballpark? Vivid Seats. That's how. Just download the free Vivid Seats app and easily find seats wherever your favorite team is playing. From front row to upper deck, Vivid Seats has options to fit your needs. After all, spring is here. So get on outside and treat yourself to tickets to your favorite team. Download the free Vivid Seats app today. That's Vivid Seats, the official ticket partner of ESPN. More to Stephen A. Smith Show, Meek Mill, NBA playoffs, and NFL items to come, particularly as the draft approaches. In a minute, you're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Brought to you by Pensor Synthetics, by the way, taking synthetic motor oil performance to a whole new level. So make the switch to Pensor Synthetics today. Back to the phones before we get into this story um, that was leaked to the New York Times. Secretly audio taped. NFL meetings with the players over Colin Kaepernick and the protest and President Trump. You know, going after the NFL the way that he did last season. All of that. We'll get into all of that and more as we move forward. Lewis in New Jersey, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Good afternoon, Lewis. How are you, sir? Good, Stephen A. How are you doing, man? I'm doing First right. time caller, bro. Biggest fan, man. Thank I, you. I love you, bro. You keep it real all the time. Man. I appreciate I love it. everything about you, brother. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate um, I'm that. Gonna get, I'm, I'm going to get right to the point, Stephen, right? Yep. Look, man, the reality is that the penal system in this country is mm-hmm. a multi-billion dollar industry. Yep. Things are not going to change. Why? Because blacks and Latino brothers, we are a commodity. Um, we make we make money for other people, so mm-hmm. they're not going to change the laws for us because we make too much money and too many people will lose their jobs. This this judge, she will have lost her job if they re- revise the penal system in this country. But unfortunately, it's not going to happen. We warehouse and we jail more more young men in this country than any other country in the world mm-hmm. because we make so much more money in our penal system in this country than any other country in the world. Well, I said that earlier. I mean, there's no question that, uh, I mean, it's probably, you know, you got some jails that are, uh, you know, private industries. And obviously because of it, you know, they're able to uh, generate a level of revenue uh, that they certainly don't want compromised. I mean, just think about that for a second. We live in a nation that allows individuals to profit off of mass incarceration. Think about that. All right. And we have a penal system that some would say, uh, Most would say, particularly from the minority community, most would say facilitates those things happening. And so when you have that going on, that leads to the division and the divisiveness that has raked through this country like a virus for centuries now. Okay, and this is before jail cells was being built, uh, being built. You know, you're talking and I don't I'm not trying to go that route. It's a sports show. But when people bring up slavery and they talk about modern day servitude in certain respects, these are the kind of things that are alluding to. Like, for example, I have absolutely no problem. You're a convicted felon. You're incarcerated. Do your time. But once you get out, once you get out and you're trying to become a a model citizen and you've you've paid your debt to society, why should you not have the right to vote? You You should have the right to vote once you've done your time. You've done your time. And they're, they're, they're let out, and, and you should be allowed to move forward. You understand? Now, if you get caught busted with another crime, damn it, bring the hammer down upon you. But if you're a law-abiding citizen, after you've been incarcerated, you should be allowed to vote. 
You should. Plain and simple, because you did your time. So there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of problems. But at the same time, when we're protesting or we're celebrating the release of someone, okay, if it's about that individual, then we got to take everything into consideration. we got to take into account the charges from 2008. we got to take into account the sentencing in 2009. Another jail sentence, you know, in June of 2009, the multiple occasions where, you know, testing positive for marijuana or opioid use or whatever from 2010 to 2012, a court date that had to be rescheduled because he was unavailable in 2012, you know, a violation in March 2013, another violation in March and July of of 2014. What I'm saying is if you're going to focus on the individual, then we have to hope that Meek Mill continues to showcase what kind of individual he is and how much he's learned from his mistakes that he has admittedly made. But if we're not focusing on him and instead we're talking about our penal system, our issue of mass incarceration, the parole and probation system and the way it's raked through various communities in this country. Now that's a different cause worth fighting for. That's why we all need to be careful about fighting for individuals over the causes. We need to fight for the causes and we need to make sure that those individuals illuminate our concerns about the cause. Because when we get caught up in just the individual, what they can do is tear down the individual and dilute our argument. You feel where I'm coming from, Lewis? Definitely see where you're coming from, Stephen A. Um, I mean, and I'll leave it with this. I mean, I'm speaking from someone I spent five years in the state of New Jersey and I know how rough it is. And this happened when I was in my 20s. I'm 41 years old. I still get judged based on what I did when I was 20 years old. I'm a father, too, who is an excellent father to my children. And based on what I did when I was 20 years old, I'm still judged today based on that. And that's not fair because that's not the, that's not the country that I'm supposed to be living in. That's not the system that I'm told that it was to rehabilitate me. It's not, that's not what it really is, and that's not what fair it's point. about. So you're absolutely right. If fair we're going to fight for something, let's fight for the cause. Let's fight for the real cause. Because there's a lot of meat meals in the system right. that we don't get a second chance when we come home. Which we is, really don't. We which, just, which, is what, which is what Bernard right Hopkins, back. which is what Bernard Hopkins, the former undisputed middleweight champion of the world, said. Lewis, I couldn't put it that bet any better myself. Those I'm going to leave you with the last words on that. Thank you so much, my brother. I appreciate it. Call back anytime. 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. You're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. We'll get into the NCAA commission the committee led by Condoleezza Rice and what their suggestions have been to sort of clean up college sports and the NFL big time meeting leaked to the New York times. We'll explain our number two up next with Stephen a on ESPN radio. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen a Smith show weekdays at 1 PM Eastern on ESPN radio and the ESPN app. This this is the Stephen a Smith show podcast. I'm Stephen A. A couple of very important things I need to get to before we go back to the phones. Talking about the NBA playoffs, talking about the release of Meek Mill, talking about the issue of mass incarceration and how that needed to be addressed and why Meek Mill's release really, really needed to be celebrated. It's not because of Meek Mill. It's because the issue of mass incarceration and the issues that deal with our parole and probation system, um, those kind of things need to be addressed particularly in the state of Pennsylvania, but obviously it exists pretty much everywhere. Um, we'll continue to talk about that as the show progresses. going to have a family member of a dear friend that I lost on the show a little bit later on to discuss a couple of things uh, relevant to the city of Philadelphia, considering the fact that Philadelphia is in, uh, in route to the conference finals, if not the finals, as far as I'm saying, I know they're in the second round, but I think they're going that far. That's what I'm saying, because I'm me. Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive's Home Insurance. Get your quote at Progressive.com today. News came out this morning. And reading from a story in the Associated Press, the Commission on College Basketball sharply directed the NCAA to take control of the sport, calling for sweeping reforms to minimize one and done, permit players to return to school after going undrafted by the NBA, and banning cheating coaches for life. The independent commission led by former secretary of state Condoleezza Rice released a detailed 60 page report Wednesday, seven months after the group was formed by the NCAA in response to a federal corruption investigation that rocked college basketball. 
Ten people, including some assistant coaches, have been charged in a bribery and kickback scheme, and high-profile programs such as Arizona, Louisville, and Kansas have been tied to possible NCAA violations. Quote, the members of this commission come from a wide variety of backgrounds, but the one thing that they share in common is that they believe the college basketball enterprise is worth saving, Rice told the Associated Press. We believe there's a lot of work to do in that regard, that the state of the game is not very strong. We had to be bold in our recommendations. The Stephen A. Smith Show will definitely do what we can to try and get uh, Condoleezza Rice on this show in the very, very near future. Looking forward to... um talking to her whenever I'm privileged to have that day occur. Definitely something that um I'm looking forward to. Here's my issue. I have no problem with their position on a one and done rule. It needs to go. I love the fact that they want to allow players who entered the NBA draft, but did not get drafted to return back to college basketball. I love that. I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love the idea of a lifetime ban for coaches who are violators, you know, of, of, of major transgressions. You know, major violations. Those who commit them should be banned for life. Here's one thing that I would say I wish I would have seen, if not two things. A, I wish I would have seen. I wish I would have seen them say, not only are you banned for life from college basketball, we've reached an agreement with the NBA that says you're going to be banned from them too. And if least, and if, if, and if not total outright banishment, at least say you can't be a head coach on the NBA level. That would be nice because if you're the NBA, why should you want cheats in your league? So I cheat in college basketball, but I'm going to come to your league. Why would you want that? Band together as lovers of basketball and demand that a certain level of integrity is exercised no matter what. If you can't do that, why should you be there? So that's a big deal with me. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't be allowed a second chance, even if you commit a major violation. I'm not saying you shouldn't be allowed a, a second chance to work. I'm saying you shouldn't be allowed a second chance at that particular job. In other words, you can never be a head coach again. You can be an assistant. You can be, you know, you can be an assistant coach. You can be a scout. You can be something like that, but you are not allowed to ever be the head coach of a program again. That's what I am a proponent of. So I look at that idea, and that really, really resonates with me. Outside of that, the one other thing that I didn't see that I would have liked to have seen um, I would like to have seen the sneaker companies addressed. They have incredible influence. It's not about the AAU coaches. Somebody's paying them and the high school coaches. Who do you think it is? It's the sneaker companies. When you get, when you get involved with the sneaker companies and you start highlighting the role that they play in influencing who's hired and influencing the power of a program because of the money that they funnel into programs, those are things that can't be ignored and I don't think they should be. So I think that those are the kind of things that I was missing from this board. The AEU is not the problem. It's who's fun. It's who, it's who's financing them. That's the problem. And see, we say this and we might have a, we might have, think about this. I'm going to tell you who comes out looking really pretty in all of this. LaVar Ball. Heard that name in a while. Have you haven't heard that name in a while? Have you in Lithuania with his sons for the most part? I think he's back by now, but let me tell you why he comes up looking good. Because the things that he was trying to do, he talked about what the NCAA has been doing. And he said, why on earth should I have to deal with that? He said, folks exploit our children all the time. Why can't we exploit them if the ones who are benefiting are their own families? Why can't we do that? It's just me. It's just me. 888, say ESPN is 888-729-3776. That's one item I want to touch on. Here's the other item. New York Times, article written today, headline, inside the confidential NFL meeting to discuss national anthem. And I read the first couple of graphs to you because this is very important. NFL owners, players, and league executives, about 30 in all, convened urgently at the league's headquarters on Park Avenue in October, nearly a month after President Trump began deriding the league and its players over protests during the national anthem. 
It was an extraordinary summit. Rarely do owners and players meet in this manner. But the president's remarks about players who were kneeling during the anthem had catalyzed the level of public hostility that the NFL had never experienced. In the spirit of partnership at the meeting, the owners decided that they and the players should, should, should sit in alternating seats around the large table that featured an NFL logo in the middle. Quote, let's make sure that we keep this confidential, Commissioner Roger Goodell said to begin the meeting. And then the next, very next graph of the article says, the New York Times has obtained an audio recording of the roughly three-hour meeting. And several people in the room corroborated details of the gathering. See, that's the problem. That's the problem. Now, we might learn some things because we've learned a few things. Uh, Eric Reed, Colin Kaepernick's former teammate, the first to kneel uh, beside him, uh, talked about them wanting justice and what have you, but Colin Kaepernick still doesn't have a job. Reed attended the meeting wearing a Colin Kaepernick T-shirt over his dress shirt and tie. He says, I feel like he was hung out to dry. Everyone in here is talking about how much they support us. Nobody stepped up and said, we support Colin's right to do this. We all let him become public enemy number one in this country, and he still doesn't have a job. That's what Eric Reed said, but that was the only time Colin Kaepernick was brought up. Outside of that, the owners needed to address it because Robert Kraft was talking about the big elephant in the room. I shouldn't say Eric Reed was the only one that brought up Colin Kaepernick. Chris Long, according to this article, he brought him up as well. He said if he was on a roster right now, all this negativeness and divisiveness could be turned into a positive. Long said he did not wish to lecture any team on what quarterbacks to sign, but, quote, we all agree in this room as players that we, he, Colin Kaepernick, should be on a roster. The owner's responses were noncommittal. The Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie said that fighting for social justice is not about one person. He called Trump. I'm sorry, Robert Kraft, the owner, the elephant in the room, called his friend, who's been a longtime supporter of. He said it's divisive and horrible what Trump was doing. Lori called Trump's presidency disastrous. Buffalo Bills owner Terry Pagulia sounded anguished over the uncertainty of when Trump would take another shot at the league. All Donald needs to do is to start to do this again. We need some kind of immediate plan because of what's going on in our society. All of us now, we need to put a Band-Aid on what's going on in this country. Jacksonville Jaguars owner from Pakistan, Shad Khan, Shad Khan, countered that the worst was behind them. He said all the damage Trump's going to do is done. The owners kept returning to one bottom line issue. Large numbers of fans and sponsors had become angry about the protests. Boycotts had been threatened and jerseys burned. And most worrisome, TV ratings were declining. Houston Texans owner Bob McNair, we all remember him, right? Can't let those inmates run the asylums. Remember him? He said, you fellas need to ask your compadres. This is this. I'm reading from the time. I'm reading from the times here. This is not me. He said, you fellas need to ask your compadres. Fellas, stop that other business. Let's go out and do something that really produces positive results, and we'll help you. That's what McNair said. Stephen Ross raised the idea of a march on Washington by NFL players and owners. They weren't really trying to hear that one. Okay? And by the way, if you're wondering about the march on Washington, and how some folks outside the black community might feel about another march. Go watch Dave Chappelle on Netflix. He said if Martin Luther King uh, had a sneaker deal, he'd be he'd be gone. He would have been gone. He would have never become who he became. He'd march on Washington. Dave Chappelle did some skit talking about Martin. We really we really loved him. He said we really need you to tone down the rhetoric. But I don't understand. I thought that's why I had a sneaker deal in the first place. Yeah, the marching, the marching, we, we know, we've got no problem with that. But the rhetoric, oh. go see Dave Chappelle on Netflix. It was hilarious. But you get the picture and you get the point, don't you? When you talk about these things, they're sensitive subjects. 
I mean, you talk about, think about it. Before the meeting, owners had quoted uh, Thomas Paine. That was Arthur Blank. Martin Luther King Jr. Selma March. Ross from the Dolphins. And Giants owner John Mara expressed hope. We have a chance to do something monumental. Demora Smith, executive director of the Players Union, said, I like the language of, quote, unquote, our issues. And, of course, they ultimately issued a statement saying NFL executives and owners joined NFLPA executives and players leaders to review and discuss plans to utilize our platform to promote equality and effectuate positive change. Here's the problem with all of this, ladies and gentlemen. The meeting was leaked. And when you have a meeting that's leaked, trust diminishes drastically. Which means another meeting like this either wouldn't take place or there would be nothing authentic that came out of it. Because people would be worried about being taped secretly. Trust matters. Trust was violated here. And whoever did it, whether it was an owner or a player, whomever did it, should be ashamed of themselves. They cannot be trusted. You could have simply come out went on camera and said what you had to say to secretly tape somebody and put them in that position is wrong because it builds and foments distrust. And you can't do that and expect to be dealt with on the up and up in a world of business. Now, having said all of that, notice how they talked about doing something that we could do to provoke change. Notice how everyone was noncommittal about Colin Kaepernick. You know why they were noncommittal about Colin Kaepernick? Because Colin Kaepernick is not the issue to them. Their money is. And their attitude is, we have nothing against Colin Kaepernick other than the fact he's costing us money. If he wasn't costing us money, we wouldn't care. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in the world of business, I want you to tell me where you can find somebody that's going to think otherwise. I want you to show me where you're going to find somebody that's not going to give a damn about the bottom line and all they care about is doing the right thing. We're not talking utopia here. We're just not. The fact of the matter is, is that if you are a person, if you are a person, That is a business owner. It's virtually impossible to believe that you're not going to care about the bottom line. So Eric Reed coming in there with the Colin Kaepernick shirt on over his shirt and tie is admirable. I applaud his courage. But Nuno, John, could y'all double check for me? Didn't Eric Reed say he wasn't going to kneel anymore? I think DD did. Let me double check that. Because you see, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty sure that he did say that. I'm pretty sure that he said that. See, these are the kind of things that we got to be put on our big boy and our big girl pants about. If you affect somebody's bottom line, they're going to get rid of you. Eric Reed, March 23rd, 2018, says he will not protest during the national anthem if an NFL team signs him. That was the headline. So as much as he stuck out his chest and voiced his dismay and concern, he still capitulated. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not saying that to insult Eric Reed one bit. I think he's smart because what more can you do? Your message has been sent. He's not punking out or anything. He's being wise. Some of you might feel differently. But then again, some of you might not be smart. 888-SAY-ESPN is 888-729-3776. Let's just keep it real. In the world of business, bottom line comes first. Everything else is second. It's not all that matters, but damn it, it matters most. Steve in Vegas, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, Stephen A. Thank you so much, man. I respect and appreciate all you do. Uh, been a big fan of yours uh, for a long time. But Thank I you. wanted to give you a counter argument about, uh, you know, parole violations. Sure. Now think about 
but yeah, think think about someone who committed a crime, strong arm robbery, whatever, what have you. Mm-hmm. They've given fifteen years. You know, they serve eight. They have five years of probation. In those five years, you said it yourself. Trust matters. The the system trusts you to be on your best behavior. That means you are free with limitations. You cannot cross state lines. You have to be on your best behavior. If you violate the rules of you being out early, then you get sent back to jail and you get sent back to prison. What have you? You knew the rules going in. You accepted the probation and the freedom. The alternative is you stay in and do your time. So my argument is that when when you are out on parole, probation, or anything, you violate probation, you go back in because you agreed to that prior to, to, to leaving prison early. Well, let me say this to you. That's a cogent argument. I'm not about to sit here and decry it and, 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 and act like you don't have substance to your argument. I certainly wouldn't imply that. What I am saying to you is that you're either in jail or you're not. You have some judges. It's not one uh, a dogged uh, particular rule and regulation or a set of them anyway that you do or don't follow. You have things that are implemented at the discretion of judges. One judge, this doesn't matter to them that much. Another judge, it's everything. You know, like for a guy to go out, you know, in Meek Mill's case, you're popping wheelies and they consider that a violation of your parole. And to one judge, it doesn't matter. To the Pennsylvania Supreme Court or what have you, it didn't matter. To the particular judge, Denise Brinkley, he deserved two to four years. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if you are the NFL, or the NBA, and you say, for example, you have a policy against weed. That's finite. That is clear. That is indiscriminate, period. But when there's wiggle room in our system, then we have to look at the system when laws are exacted with a heavy hand against some and dealt lightheartedly with others. And we have to take that into account and go on a case-by-case basis because of it. You feel me? I I hear you, Stephen. I, I, I do. However, you know, you knew you knew the terms of your probation coming out. You must be on your best behavior. Trust matters. The system is trusting you to be on your best behavior. And if your best behavior in those three to five years, whatever the time frame is, is that you will not break the law. You will not prospect state lines. You will be on your best behavior. Yeah, but you got to remember, stop right there, there. stop right there. Because remember, he was out of jail until the pop and wheelies incident. So what I'm saying to you is, sir, do you really sit there with a straight face and think that because somebody is popping wheelies on a bike, that it warrants two to four years in prison? Well, one thing, no, I don't. But one thing that you start, start, Start right there, start right there. You don't. I'm saying other judges don't. So the things that you're pointing to, while I respect your argument, the way it's diluted is by the very system you're talking about. Because it's not a system we're talking about, it's an individual. That individual judge just had the power of the system behind her to originally invoke that sentence before it was compromised by a higher court. But the fact that it was compromised by a higher court shows that in all likelihood it was some it was boundaries that she should not have exceeded in the first place. I, I don't disagree with you there, Stephen. I really don't. But I do know that when you're out, the alternative is you do your complete time, and when you're out, you're out. Second thing I wanted to bring up is you mentioned about voting. You know, someone that commits strong arm robbery, are, are, do you feel that they should have the right to own a gun if they did their time? Good question. Hmm. Interesting, because that's touching on the very crime they committed. Sir? I don't have an answer to that. It's a rare moment on the Stephen A. Smith show. I honestly don't have an answer because I got to admit to you. I mean, damn, if you like, for example, if you are somebody that did time, uh, for, for pedophilia. Okay. I don't want you around children. I know you out, but I don't want you around children. You see my point? So that's, I mean, that, 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 I, I don't want you around children. So I guess my answer would be no. You know what? I guess my answer would be no. You don't deserve a gun. You gave up your privilege to own a gun when you committed a crime with a gun. But I don't see how that correlates to you need, deserving to be have the right to vote once you've done your time. 
I'm because the crime, the crime that you committed wasn't against voting. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> you didn't commit a crime against voting. You yeah. committed that crime. So if you committed a crime with a gun and they say you can no longer p- possess a gun, fine. If you're a pedophile, all right, and they don't want you around children, well, you've given up that right because that's the crime you got busted for. But that doesn't mean that you don't have the right to vote about the economy or about education or about immigration reform or any other issue that's going on in this country once you've done your time. But that's just me. I got to run, Steve. I appreciate the call, but I appreciate those questions. Very enlightening. Had me percolating there a little bit. Had me thinking about some things. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Have a potential guest coming on the line. But before that, got some issues to touch on. NBA playoffs, NFL. The list goes on and on. Stick around. It's Steve Nate Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Ryan, I don't know how else to say this, so I'll just say it. What is it, Linda? I think we should see other people. Are you breaking up with me on a roller coaster? Well, we do have a lot of fun. Maybe we should stay together. An emotional roller coaster? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. I just need a little me time. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance. Small business protection just got easier. With more than 30 coverage options available, Progressive has you covered. More at ProgressiveCommercial.com. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to just interrupt the proceedings to bring a little personal touch to the show. Um, Back in uh, December, early December, December 3rd of 2010, um, a former colleague, contemporary, a friend, a really, really good man who did an outstanding, an absolutely outstanding and phenomenal job over many years covering the Philadelphia 76ers. 29 of his 38 years with the Philadelphia Daily News was spent covering the Philadelphia 76ers. His name was Phil Jasner. He had passed away after a two-year battle with cancer. And as I watched the Philadelphia 76ers make this run, I'd I think about him often because I can only imagine what this time, these times would have been like for him. I've got a pretty damn good idea what it would have been like for him. I got a pretty damn good idea of how he would have been while these times were going on with the Philadelphia 76ers doing what they're doing on the basketball court right now. But there's nobody, and I do mean nobody, that can chronicle his feelings, his emotions, his actions, what he would have been like at this particular moment in time better then his wonderful son, who I know very, very well, he's a freelance sports writer, and obviously he's right here with me right now. His name is Mr. Andy Jasner, uh, the author of the book On the Case. You know, numerous writings of uh, his daddy, Phil Jasner, from back in the day. What's going on, Andy? How are you, buddy? How's everything? Uh, I'm doing great, Stephen. I'm truly honored. Thank you so much for having me on. My pleasure. My pleasure. Talk to our audience about this book, what inspired you to write it. I think it's obvious, uh, but what some of the things that we'd find in this book. Talk to me about that for a second. Absolutely. The, the best way I could describe it, Stephen A., the, the book was a true labor of love. I mean, losing my dad, uh, like you said, back in 2010 was was just it was so tragic and I still obviously I will never get over it. And and I wanted to get I wanted to get his legacy to last forever. Not that it needed it, um, but being a writer myself, I figure what's the best way to do it? So let let him tell the story. I wrote a very small chapter myself. I talked to the likes of Alan Iverson, Charles Barkley, Doug Collins, uh, Billy Cunningham, Vince Papali, on and on and on. Uh, they gave some reflections of my dad and then I, I went and I went through, boy, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of articles, and I picked 60. And I said, I'm going to break it up into chapters just to give readers just a sampling of, of the type of work uh, that he did. And, and I hope the words you know, shine through, and I think that they did. And it was a very therapeutic project, and it really it made me feel good. People still come up to me, and, you know, and it's just, it was a wonderful feeling. I'm happy I did it. It wasn't easy, uh, but we got it done. And and just a little aside to that, Stephen, like one thing Dad always told me, and I mean this in the best possible way, he goes, Stephen used to tick me off. I'm like, why? Because he pushed me to work harder because he just would never let up. I I know you know that, 
But I just wanted to reiterate that well, to you. Yeah, it was amazing because I was a beat writer competing against your dad, and I often tell the story. I remember, um, believe it or not, I got arrested at the uh, driving from the palace at Auburn Hills because mm-hmm. I had a suspended license and didn't know it. I had paid the ticket, but I still owed fifteen dollars on it oh. and didn't know, and I I had no idea. So I was with a bunch of guys, and we were driving in the car together, and they took me into custody in Detroit, Michigan, and they gave me an opportunity to, to you know. To, Right. Who do you want us to call? I said, call Phil Jasner. Call oh, Phil you Jasner. made the right call. You made the right call. <laughs> I said, call Phil Jasner, who would get me out of there in a heartbeat. But I, I want to go back to you in this book on the case, Phil Jasner on the case, because that clearly is applicable. It is a great title. When you think about the 60 articles, the 60 columns that you pulled out mm-hmm. of there, uh, you know, talk to me, first of all, about what kind of columns are in there. And more importantly, what made you pick from the uh, of the thousands he wrote? What made you pick? Those particular sixty, what was resonating with you about them? Uh, well, it it took me several years, so you can see how many I went through to pick the ones that I picked, and the ones that I really settled on. Like for instance, Stephen, uh, there was one in 1987. Uh, it was Julius Irving's last season, I believe, and Dad wrote like a 6,500 word story, kind of proving that Doc could fly. He took like an out of the box type of, of look at him, talked to scientists and mm-hmm. and doctors and everybody and like the last two sentences in that article uh were something i'm going to paraphrase not exactly i will always believe that doc could fly and that's what i will tell my grandchildren one day like i had never read that or maybe if i did i don't remember mm-hmm. but now with three daughters myself when i went back and read that you know it gave me chills after the fact so that was one there was like a profile of Will chamberlain where he spent an entire day in his mansion in california uh, and he wrote just just a wonderful profile on him. And then I can go back to the early years. Uh, like he wrote he wrote a column uh, like back in the seventies uh, on the Phillies, and and I forgot that he had even covered baseball. Uh, there was the soccer years where if you ask the soccer community when the Adams won that NASL title back in nineteen seventy three, they acted like Dad was 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 gold because he treated that team the same as he did the 82-83 Sixers That's team. True. And, for instance, in that year, I went and, and I found an article, and I, I didn't remember this, Stephen. A. Moses Malone had stopped talking to the media for a short time that year. Yep. But he kept talking to Phil. Yep. He might have been <laughs> off the record, but he kept talking to him. Right. I, I mean, to, to, to learn these facts about my dad after, the, after you know, he had passed on was, was surreal. But, again, it was just very therapeutic. And, and I picked – I mean, I could have picked 600, but – I didn't want a six thousand, you know, a sixty-five thousand word book, so mm. I had to I had to pin it down at some point, and and uh, so I, I tried to pick the ones that really stood out the most. A- Andy Jasner, the father for the late great Phil Jasner, former writer extraordinaire for the Philadelphia Daily News, he's right here with Stephen A. on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. I remember when I came to Philadelphia to watch Allen Iverson's jersey being hung to the rafters, raised oh, to the boy. rafters rather. And that night, Allen Iverson mentioned me, and everybody had brought that up. And I said, remember, you mentioned Phil Jasner, too, uh, because mm-hmm. he, he called your dad uh, the best in the world of sports journalism. And certainly uh, all of us had so much love for your father. That's, you know, that, that kind of adulation and affection we certainly in, in, had for him. What did your dad think of Allen Iverson? Well, it was so funny. It's like no different than than a, than a parent and a son, or you know, or a couple of brothers or sisters just arguing. When those battles were going through, like they they would bicker a lot. Like the yeah. like he would call me, and, and the bickering was, you know, it was kind of like nonstop. And I'm like, is there going to be an end game here? Yep. You know, in the famous practice press conference. You know, after that ended, I was working in North Carolina at the time. Dad called me. And he goes, what do I do? I mean, what do you mean, what do you do? You, you go write the story like you always do. But he questioned my integrity. I'm like, well, all right. I said, there, there's a backstory to this press conference, too. So, like, take your time, go investigate it. And then he called me back and he said, well, I didn't know that Alan's best friend, you know, had just died before this. And there were all these other factors. I said, exactly. So it wasn't personal. But it is what it is. Go take it. Roll with it. You know, and it took some time. But th- they would laugh about that after. I mean, when I talked to Alan for the book, Stephen A., he was embarrassed by that pre- by that press conference with Dad. Mm-hmm. He goes, "I was young; it was my fault." He goes, and, and obviously neither one of us handled it all that well. But you know, as time went on, they just uh, there was a mutual admiration that just grew bigger and bigger. And 
Um, you know, when I talk with Alan, I mean, he, he was crying in a suite at the Wells Fargo Center. It was it was truly touching. Andy, as we sit here today and the Philadelphia 76ers are about to make this run, I got to get ready to go, but I got to I got to reach sure. out to you about this real quickly. Looking at this 76ers team right now, your dad covered covered them when they won a championship. Covered them mm-hmm. when they were competitive. Covered them when they lost to the Boston Celtics. Covered them. Covered the doctor. Covered Andrew Tony and Mo Cheeks. Covered Charles Barkley during those years. Covered the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, obviously, when they went to the finals in 2001. What would your dad be like now watching this 76ers team, particularly with the Joel Embiid and the Ben Simmons? I think they would have loved your dad. They'd have loved well, him to he, death. Yeah. Number one, he wouldn't be tweeting. I can tell you that right now. That would have driven him crazy. But, but, and this is the truth, Stephen. I tell everybody this. He, he would have treated this team the same as the dreadful John Lucas team, the sure. same as the dreadful Johnny Davis team. You're right. And the man, I mean, it was, it was the energy that he had drove me crazy. And he would say, Andy, one of the few people that has the same energy as I do is Steven. So what do I do? Like, how do I outwork him? I'm like, you don't worry about him. You go do your job. He'll do his job and it'll be. But no, he he would have treated it all the same. He would have given it its proper due and, uh, and, but he would have been all into it. He would, he would have loved it every step of the way, no doubt. Winning your, does help. Your father was a great, great man, and he was always – we, we competed ferociously. You know that, but with profound respect, I've always had for him. He's been – I miss him dearly, and I've got so many funny stories that I can't even repeat over the airways, but you know it. I mean, <laughs> I your, probably your heard dad many was, of them. <laughs> your, dad was one, your dad was one of a kind. Where can people go and find this book, buddy? Oh, on the thanks, case. Stephen, Bill Jasner, sure. on the case. The best way is Amazon.com. That that's the easiest way. You just you just punch in the uh, either Phil Jasner or on the case BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, all area bookstores in the Philadelphia area, and 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 I thank anybody who buys it. It was a true, like I said, labor of love for me. My man, you take care of yourself. I'll see you down the you road too. at the Sixers game, and I'm sure, man, I'm still always. I'll be there. About you there. All right, buddy. I'll be there. See you soon. Okay, take care, bye. buddy. The one and only Andy Jasner. The son of Phil Jasner, the late great sports writer from the Philadelphia Daily News, right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. He truly was something else. Phil Jasner, he's absolutely right when he says that. It could be the worst team in the NBA or they could be a championship team. Phil Jasner definitely treated them the same exact way. He was exactly like that. Every little story mattered to him. Every little thing mattered to him. There is no question about that. That is the absolute truth. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go before we get on out of here for the day. Let's go to Kenny in New Jersey. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Kenny? Hey, how you doing, Stephen A.? Talk to me. All right, look, I wanted to um, help out real quick about that felony in Bolton. Um, if you are convicted of a felony, but you served your time and you don't have probation or parole, you are eligible to vote again. Okay. But they don't tell you that. What they tell you is... When you become a felony, that you lose your right to vote. And that's absolutely not true. Once you've served out your time, you have no probation, no parole, and no supervised release, you can um, vote again. Well, that's good to so. know. That's good to know. I appreciate the call, and I appreciate the help out, Kenny. Thank you so much. Let's go to John in Long Island. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, John. Stephen A., what's up, man? Go ahead. Two quick ones. At what point do you start to question Billy Donovan for what's going on? I've been OKC? questioning him. Question number two. A big question to him. And, ain't, no, and, ain't no discussion I'm a, there. I'm a question. huge Melo fan. I know I know he's not playing the way he's supposed to be, but leaving Westbrook in the game with three personals, five and a half minutes left, come on, man. You All can't right. do that. What's your second point? And then, and then um, if, if LeBron tests free agency, do you see any, any scenario where um, Melo and Wade can can join forces with him and go Mello, somewhere? No, I can't see it. I think it's over. I think the way Wade is going to retire. That's my per- yeah, that's my personal belief, and I don't know what I don't know what Mello is going to do. I just know how he's looking right now, which ain't that great. I appreciate the call, though, John. Thank you so much, Shaquille in South Carolina. Talk to me. You're live with Stephen A. Hey, Stephen A. Real quick, um, if you think Dwayne Wade's going to retire, where do you rank him in the all-time list of shooting guards? I don't know. I got to think about that, but it's not top two. It's Michael Jordan and Kobe. He don't come before them. Uh, I guess you got to put Oscar Robinson in the mix there. Um, you know, or Elgin Baylor rather. You know, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I would say I would tell you maybe top five, um, but not top three. That's what. That's a safe bet where I can go with it, Shaquille. What's your second question okay. real quick? Um, regard, regarding health, do you think that he can still play at, at, a, at a at a good level next year for, for the, next team? Dwayne Wade? 
Yes, sir. No, yes, sir. I, I, my, my, my issue with Dwayne Wade is that I think his body is worn down. I think the 15 years in his league have been incredibly taxing for him because of the load that he's had to carry. I'm sure he can do some things, but I just think that on a night in, night out basis, it's a very, very difficult thing for him to do. It is tough for him because he just lives in a certain situation. I mean, it's just one of them things. And I, I'm just of the mindset that it's time. It's about that time right now for him. Uh, to call it call it quits. I don't know whether he will or not, but it's about that time. Got to get on out of here. Mahalo at y'all 22 hours from now. It's about that time to get on out of here from the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, but I will be back in 22 hours. NFL Draft is tomorrow, and I can't wait. Talk to you then. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.